You are listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, the fastest clothing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And Daniel Freib. Hello, chaps. Back in, it feels like going back in time, doesn't it? Where are we, Lionel? We're outside the National Theatre on London's South Bank, our old home venue, wasn't it, for many a week, many a month, and uh, first return here for a little while. It signals to me that this the season, the road racing season at least, is is beginning to wind down, and uh, well, autumn is certainly upon us now, isn't it? Well, it's freezing. It's freezing, and uh, but confusingly, there's a helicopter above us, which makes me think that there must be a bike race nearby. Maybe, maybe us pelotons going to sweep past us here in the South Bank. I think the Extinction Rebellion peloton are blocking oh. one of the bridges over there. Is that uh, what that is? There's been a bit of a bit of a ah. barrage <laughs> over there. <laughs> oh dear! Extinction, Extinction Rebellion, but. Rebellin, Davide Rebellin is still not extinct. I think he's going to ride next year for a Hungarian team. He might even be at the Giro. <laughs> Extinction Rebellin is something How old is different. Rebellin now? For, he's born in 1971, I think. In So I think August 1971 off the top of my head. So um, <laughs> almost 50. Yeah. Wow. I was wondering whether he would switch to esports just for the sunset of his racing career and would uh, become a sensation. Uh, uh, indoor static well, it's cycling. It's funny you should mention that because I think he did. Did he not ride some of the E Giro, which is the uh, Giro on electric bikes? But that's outdoors and actually moving. That's actual the Giro on E's. Factual, factual e, e cycling rather than virtual e cycling. Well, funny you should mention that, though, isn't it? Because that has been in the news. What have we got coming up this week, Lionel? Well, Rich, we've got three big talking points in this episode of the Cycling Podcast. In the first part, we're going to talk about Giorgio Squincy, who was the sponsor, long-time sponsor of the the MAPE team, arguably, well, certainly one of the best teams of the 20th century. Daniel has a lot of information about the history of the MAPE team. He died um, last week at the age of 76. In the second part, we'll be hearing from Graham Bartlett, the CEO of Velon, uh, about the Hammer Series and their dispute with the UCI. Richard and Daniel, you both went and met Graham Bartlett last week, so we'll hear that. Um, The Hammer Series Hong Kong race, which was due to be held this weekend, has been cancelled because of protests in Hong Kong, not deemed to be safe to hold a bike race there at the moment. And in the final part, we'll talk about the controversy in esports and uh, the British esports road race not road race championship is it it's just the british esports championship didn't take place on a real road we're going, we're also going to talk about il lombardia aren't we look ahead to the the last monument of the season at the weekend uh, a bit more racing and there has been a little bit of racing hasn't there has there? been some racing yes um alvaro hodge won the munsterland giro and then came to grief in the f- final lap or the final um, straight of the Tour de l'Euro Metropole uh, had a very, pretty nasty crash there um, other racing in Italy leading up Munsterland, to... Munsterland, did you see the punch up? Oh yeah, the punch up sorry, that how, was, could, I, how could I miss um, the punch up? Florian Seneschal came to blows, Daniel your man, long predicted Paris-Roubaix winner Seneschal Does, uh, him also, m- was, this on the, was this part of the plan? Um, well, um, Max Valscheid is another another of my pet projects. I've been waiting to come good for a few years. So, um, yeah, they had it out, didn't they? Is this a kind of knockout for your affections? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> you can only champion so. one of them going forward. Um, well, yeah, the, uh, quite a bit of racing in Italy leading up to in Lombardia at the weekend. Um, Sonny Colbrelli won the Grand Prix Bruno Begelli and Primoz Roglic won the Giro dell'Emilia on the same climb where he won the opening time trial of the Giro d'Italia in Bologna. That's right, isn't it? Correct. No and he, he, was, he scorched up there. He went even quicker um, than he did in the time trial, I gather. Yeah, I don't think he quite got the record, did he, for the San Luca climb? But um, very impressive. Uh, he won by over, over 10 seconds, didn't he? Um, looks in good nick, does old Rog, um, ahead of 
Tour of Lombardy. After seeing him in the mix zone in Harrogate after the World Championships, where he got in that early break and then climbed off when they reached the circuit, I, I thought that was his season done and dusted. He Well, they all looked cold and miserable, but he looked like a man who'd uh, done enough for 2019, but clearly not. Talking of um, climbs, Napalm, and the uh, Emilia-Romagna region, that was where also where Begelli was. Um, I don't know that much about um, the GP Begelli. I've never been to that race, but I was reading about the, the history of the, the, the climb that basically decides that race. Race, um, the Zappolino climb. Um, the, it was the scene of a famous battle, the Battle of the Stolen Bucket, um, in 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 the Middle Ages. There battle. you go. Do we? Kn- oh, this is a, this could turn into a very convoluted tangent, but I'm go- I'm not going to go there. Well, this is already a meandering version of the news roundup. But who was Bruno Begelli? Do you know? I don't know. I know, but I know about the stolen bucket. Well, we'll have I, to. I, I don't Begelli, no, I don't actually. I, I, I have known at some point in the past, but I've forgotten. <laughs> oh, my God. This is like the time you asked if you like vermouth. <laughs> oh it's only the time you've been stumped. Your, your mission for 2020, Daniel, is by the time of the next edi- edition, you uh, can tell us who Bruno Begelli was. I know about it. Was. Mm. Yeah. I also know about the so the, the Battle of the Stolen Bucket. It was also the subject of a famous poem by I know the, um I know about the poet who wrote it, um Alessandro Tassoni. I I'd actually like Daniele Friberincini here, um <laughs> which he's now called, um to go and to, uh, take in all these Italian autumn classics next year for a friend special. So, uh, uh, they're they're really fascinating and beautiful races to watch aren't they they are and as we've said before they've been given a bit of a new lease of life by basically a rare incident of sort of coherent calendar planning they've all been sort of grouped together whereas once upon a time they were sort of dispersed before and after the world championships but now it makes a nice block of racing doesn't it well yeah they used to be the kind of selection races for the italian world championship team didn't they after the tour de france uh, running sort of through august and then there was another little flurry just before your lombardia but you're right this kind of lead up to Il Lombardia is good. Uh, one man who looks good for Il Lombardia, I think, is Adam Yates, who won the Crow Race or the Tour of Croatia. Um, overall, tuned up nicely. And we'll well, what was this Crow Race business? It reminded me, have you seen these things? I don't know, it's a London phenomenon, Crow Nuts? Half croissant, half donuts. You must have seen those. I don't. Right up your street. I'm not sure it has anything to do with that, does it? <laughs> no, but no, but it reminded me of that. Is this is this the official denomination of this race now? The crow race. I'm not sure it's got anything to do with crow nuts. No. Daniel, have, while you've been in London, have you enjoyed any caps and Cardi B's? Oh dear, no. Moving on, Napalm. As you, well, you're moving on to Berlin. Do they not have Tomorrow. a hipster scene there for oh, you? Oh, Guinness. No. <laughs> what are two hipsters <laughs> no, there? No crow nuts. <laughs> Their numbers set to be swelled tomorrow. Anyway, anyway, um, away from the racing, a little bit of transfer news to update on. Uh, Nasser Buhani and Dan McClay are moving to Arkea Samsic for next season. David De La Cruz is leaving Team Ineos to go to UAE Team Emirates. And Rowan Dennis's future is still up in the air. He left Bahrain when his contract was terminated before the World Championships, and that was kept very much under wraps so he could ride the World Championships uh, you know, in peace, prepare for it without being pestered about losing his position at Bahrain Merida. Just on the Arkea um, recruitment, what, what kind of trident do you think the whimsical flanner, the dandelion picker Warren Bargill, who's re-signed there, renewed there, Nairo Man, Nairo Quintana and um, Buhani are going to form that could be a bit of an incendiary mix, could it? <laughs> well, I can't imagine that... Uh, what, what a lead-out train that is for... <laughs> <laughs> the lead-out train For Buhani. We remember from Bargill and Nairo Man. <laughs> Leading out Buhani, yeah. <laughs> could be more fisticuffs there. Anyway, on Rowan Dennis, um, he of course won the world time trial title on a BMC bike. A lot of speculation about where he'll end up. Latest hat to be thrown in the ring, not necessarily by them, but by others. Team Ineos. Could we see uh, Rowan Dennis go to Team Ineos? I think there are only two hats in the ring, from what I've heard. Um, CCC. I think he had some kind of discussion with them, so that's essentially his former team, um, sponsored by BMC. Although they won't. No, they're not sponsored by BMC anymore. Um, BMC, of course, were sponsored by BMC, <laughs> surprisingly. Um, but I think, yeah, Ineos could, could be the favourites now. But Mo- Movistar, is that a non-starter? I, I would suggest it's a non-starter. Um, I don't have any solid information on that, but I I think he, he, he's had some offers, definitely some, um, but they're not nearly of the kind of order of what he was earning at Bahrain Merida. Well, we know Rod Ellingworth, who's now started work at Bahrain Merida, um, thanks to his role with, well, technically with McLaren, isn't it? Um, we know that Ellingworth wanted to keep Dennis, but that was unsuccessful. 
Ellingworth has been busy recruiting people to the, the team set up. Roger Hammond, who was last working with Dimension Data, of course, will Ma- be Madison there. Madison Genesis. He was running Madison Genesis this year. He went back there after yeah, I'm Dimension sorry, Data. I'm, I'm sc- cut that out of the um, equation I'm referring to his last world tour position and also Tim Harris is going to be doing uh, sort of talent spotting future prospects identification uh, obviously very familiar with Tim Harris's uh, work nurturing riders over in Belgium well if you um, want to know more about Tim Harris go back to last year's friend special um, I'm released around Easter time where I spent some time with Tim Harris and in the house uh, where he accommodates lots of young riders. I was going to say, Tim Harris is uh, scouting, or had this been a, a, a few years ago, all Tim Harris would have needed to do to scout some budding talent would be check who's sleeping in his spare room. He's had <laughs> a few good riders in there. He has, yeah. Uh, a bit of a revolving door. It's quite high turnover, I think. There have been a lot of riders through there over the years. And lastly, although it's not confirmed yet, it looks very much like the Israel Cycling Academy Katusha merger takeover, call it what you will, is going to happen yet to um, yet to get confirmation fully on that regarding the World Tour license. But that looks almost certain. And uh, well, the one big question mark about that will be which riders do they retain from the respective teams? And uh, well, it's very late in the day for those who don't make the cut to find something else for 2020. But we will keep an eye on that in the coming weeks. One little final one. Mark Cavendish to Barry Morita. Are we expecting that? There's been lots of rumours just the last few yeah, days. Yeah, done deal, I think. The fastest clothing in the world tour. The home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Ratha in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. Thank you very much indeed to our title sponsor, Rafa. Very grateful to them as ever for their support. And uh, we enjoyed being in the Rafa uh, Cafe, Rafa pop-up in Harrogate during the World Championships. A great place to watch some racing this weekend. Of course, we've got Il Lombardia on Saturday and uh, Parry Tours on Sunday. Um, so if you want to watch it in a lively place, find your nearest Rafa Cafe. Um, they're all over the world. Uh, now, Daniel, um, some or Daniele Friberencini, as I keep trying to remember to call you. Um, I mean, some some sad news, and uh, news with which you have a, a personal connection. Yeah, well, the um, the old owner of the Mappe company, um, Giorgio Squincy, um, died last week after, a, well, he's been suffering from um, cancer for, for a, um, a while, for a few months, I think. Um, and, yeah, Mappe, I think most people know, was the, the dominant team in cycling in the late 90s and early noughties and a team that really well it's, it's in that group of teams a sort of half dozen teams which you would say really uh, marked the history of professional cycling left a very deep imprint on the history of professional cycling and um, i worked for mape on well in two separate stints um towards the tail end of the sponsorship so um in the for for six months or so in i think 2000 and, and um another similar period in 2002 just when they were about to to shut down essentially but um yeah a team that um, started in 1993, they sort of saved this um, the old Eldor team, which was having financial difficulties. And um, Squincy had, had been passionate about cycling his whole life. His, his dad was a huge um, cycling fan. And it was a company that really was sort of typical of, well, phenomenon known in, in Italy as the Ita- Italian economic miracle, these sort of medium-sized kind of manufacturing companies, um, Mape made chemical adhesives and grouts and um, went from you know quite a small operation to um, one of the world leaders in that particular industry and and the cycling team was, was instrumental in that um, they started off as quite a small outfit but then um, within a year or two well within um, a year they were sort of targeting victory in the in the Tour de France with Tony Rominger and um, you know they, they the, the, the great success in the in the Grand Tours well didn't el- elude them Rominger won the Giro and the, and the Vuelta but um, they, they were never able to win the Tour de France but um, yeah Squincy became this sort of doyen this kind of Zeus figure especially in the company he was talked about in in these kind of reverential tones um, when I, I used to work there he would be sort of up on the the, the 
where he worked on the top floor of the the building in Milan, of the head office in Milan. And um, yeah, as I said, it is sort of godlike presence um, in the company. Um, and at the same time, um, someone who was very, who had great people skills, was was widely admired. You'd bump into me bump into him in the lift and what he would mainly want to talk about would be cycling and this sort of passion this connection with cycling and the team really sort of infused and infected the whole company and it was a company that under normal circumstances wouldn't have been the most glamorous to work for you know as I said chemical adhesives um, not the kind of thing that's a great icebreaker at a dinner party but um what everyone was proud of and everyone did talk about on a Monday morning that, you know, the, the first topic of conversation would be how the team got on um, at the weekend. And, you know, you'd often get riders, um, say stars from the team, the, 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 you know, the famous classic riders and Museus and, and Bartolis and Bettinis. They would be in the office for various reasons, come to see the, the Dottore. Uh, Rominger's uh, one of Rominger's old team bikes was set up on the on the turbo trainer in the company gym, um, in which you know the sort of secretary would would use um, at lunchtime. Or um, so it was it was very much part of the of the culture of the company, and um, and you know it was it's a shame in a way that it didn't it didn't last longer. But um, Mappe got out of the sport in 2002 essentially because of doping. And Squinty was someone who had, had seen this sort of plague coming and developing in the mid 90s, the EPO plague. He he tried to, to sort of stem it um, uh, in probably the, the most difficult period in cycling history to do that. Um, he, he tried to ban the sort of external coaches, Michele Ferrari, Luigi Cecchini. Um, hadn't had a whole lot of success doing that, I don't think. And I think, um, well, with Stefano Garzelli's positive test in the 2002 Giro, Squincy sort of realised that he, he was fighting a losing battle and, and all of his efforts were, were coming to nothing. And, um, you know, particularly because um, he felt the UCI, um, the governing body at the time, was, was intransigent. And he'd had his run-ins with Lance Armstrong as well. And, and he tried to sort of decry Lance Armstrong. And, and that had really... Um, that had really... Um, had no effect on the way the sport was going and the way the Tour de France was going in particular and and you know he stuck to stuck to his guns and and um, and, and sort of resigned himself to to the fact that he, he wasn't going to be able to change it from the inside and um, ultimately um, his sporting interest and Mappe's sporting interest um, veered away from cycling towards professional football and and um, he took the Sassuolo team which was a very small team um, in based in based near Reggio Emilia in the centre of Italy he took them to Serie A over the, the sort of last 15 years of his of his life which was you know his second great triumph in the sporting arena I mean that that was the impression when the team did fold that he was reluctantly stepping away that he felt you know it wasn't that the, the, the team came to a natural end or that he um, you know fell out of love with, with cycling or perhaps he did but you felt that it was uh, uh, kind of throwing his hands up in, in defeat in a way because clearly his passion for cycling remained I mean Mapai very visible at the World Championships he'd been a sponsor of the World Championships for, for, for several years so his interest in cycling obviously remained but he, he um, I think the impression at the time was that you know he was sort of admitting defeat in his efforts to uh, to, to run a, a clean team and, and change the sport. Yeah, I think it was. And I think, um, as I said, over the, the late 90s, his sort of illusions about what was going on in the sport and, and what he hoped for the sport and for the team were, were, were sort of slowly shattered. Um, there was a famous incident in the 1996 Giro when the Mape leader, um, Abraham Alano, had sort of lost lost um, time on the first mountain stage to Montesirino and he phoned up one of the director sportifs and, and Squincy says, well, you know, what's going wrong? How come Alana can't follow? And, and the director replied, well, what can we do? His hematocrit's only 52. And 52 was already over the limit that was going to be introduced at the end of that year of 50. But um, the, the assumption was that some of the riders Alana was up against were was sort of a 56, 60 and probably risking their lives at that level. But, um, you know, Squincy as I said, he tried to sort of stick his finger in the dike and and um, and, and at least run a clean team himself. But I think he, he realised that even that was impossible. You know, with the Garzelli incident, which you know in originally or initially he he defended Garzelli, but I think he well he he admitted to me in an interview years later he had doubts about whether Garzelli had been 
um, wrongly condemned. Um, and I think with hindsight, if he was honest with himself, he, he would probably have admitted that he had doubts about a lot of his team in the late 90s because they were very successful in, a te- in an era when, to be successful, you really had to sort of keep up with the, the, the doping Joneses. I mean, De Kern and Quickstep are not direct descendants of of Mapai, but there was a, a a branch of the team that sort of you know shot up el- elsewhere in Belgium um, under Patrick Lefebvre, who who worked at Mapai, and and that team kind of um, carried on the torch in a way, and it, and it and it's 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 in a similar mould, isn't it, in, in in the types of races that they that they contest, and and the t- even the types of riders they have. Yeah, very much so. Um, and there are, you know, quite a number of well staff members who were at Mappe who are still at the clinic, not just uh, Patrick Lefebvre. Just um, you mentioned about the, the sort of the impact that Mappe tried to have on the Grand Tours. Didn't win the Tour de France, as you said, but did win one Giro and one Vuelta. Really, it was in the classics and particularly Paris Roubaix um, that uh, Mappe's jersey was. Uh, well, it was. Uh, it was uh, it was ominously massed at the front on several occasions. They did the the one two three in ninety six, ninety eight, and ninety nine. I think there's of course the famous story about the ninety six edition where three Mappe riders broke away and uh, Giorgio Squincy got on the phone to Patrick Lefevre to, and they sorted out the finishing order. The Squincy particularly wanted Johan Museo to win win the race. Uh, Patrick Lefevre talks about that incident in our lunch with episode. Or coffee with Patrick Lefebvre episode for Friends of the Podcast that came out at the start of the year um, but they were a real powerhouse in, in the classics um, and particularly Paris-Roubaix and Liège Baston-Liège when well in the early days they had Michele Bartoli and then Paolo Bettini and Frank Vandenbroek of course um, well he started off with Lotto didn't he but then was uh, you know part of passed through Mapai on, on his way um, off to Cofidis I think he went I think that was st- a, a good example Lionel of the extent to which the company, its message and its values were integrated in in, in those of the team. Um, the 1996 Paris Bay, when um, you know, I think when the the phone call was was taking place with Lefebvre, um, Squincy had this kind of motto, the company motto in his mind, which was Vincere insieme. This was before the age of kind of slightly naff, um, contrived hashtags. Um, but he he was sort of visualizing the posters that he was going to put up all around the, the head office in Milan of these three riders coming over the three Mappe riders coming over the line um, together and, and sure enough you know that was um, an image that was that was used for, for years thereafter shoot uh, shoot at l'arrière du peloton cycling podcast team car at the back of the pack please that's Seb Piquet, the voice of Radio Tour at the Tour de France, to remind us to tell you that this episode of the cycling podcast is sponsored by Stitch Fix Basically, a personal stylist who will select items of clothing for you without you having to go anywhere or more or less do anything. You just complete a A style style quiz. quiz on the website... Your personal stylist will then send you five items of clothing, each hand-picked for you from a selection of over 100 best European brands, including established names and cool emerging designers and exclusive brands. You try everything on at home. You decide what you want to keep. If you don't want a particular item, you can send them back. And it's low risk. For your stylist time, you pay a £10 styling charge, which is deducted from the cost of anything you do decide to buy. Well, Richard, you got your first uh, delivery from Stitch Fix a little while ago, didn't you? Yeah, well, you, yeah, you do the style quiz online, Lionel, as, as you know, and then um, you're shown some pictures of, of outfits and you, you pick the ones you like and the ones you don't like. It was a very new experience for me. Um, I've had a box uh, with, um, yeah, five items, you know, a mix, trousers, T-shirt, shirt. I mean, what did you think of my shirt on Sunday night? We did an event at a book festival on Sunday night, and I, I wore my quite flamboyant, for me, shirt. Well, this was a thing. I don't think you would have picked that no, shirt never. had you been in a shop. But never. I thought, yeah, I mean, I don't want to... <laughs> this is awkward, isn't it? This you. is going to be... I don't want to flatter you for any reason, but it, it looked good. Thank you, good. Lionel. That was difficult for you, I know. <laughs> um, but it takes all of that kind of risk out of things, doesn't it? You don't have to, you, you don't have to try something on in the shop. Well, the th- you the can, thing, you the thing can... I hate is trousers. I ha- hate trying on trousers in shops. Taking your shoes off, putting the trousers on, putting your <laughs> shoes on again, taking your shoes off again, taking the trousers off, putting another. <laughs> it's awful. So it's quite. It's very easy, and um, 
they're, they're definitely you know it's a mix of items. I sent a couple of things back. You know, the, 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 a couple of things didn't fit fit me properly. There was one one um, polo shirt I got which I wasn't wasn't too keen on, um, but uh, you know I, I kept three out of the five items, which is pretty good hit rate I think. Well, the idea came from a Harvard graduate, Katrina Lake, who wanted to help people dress well without having to go through the pain of the shopping. Uh, also, when you buy stuff online, sometimes the sizes can be inconsistent. At Stitch Fix know how the various different brands all measure up against one another, one another so they can avoid uh, sending you things that aren't going to fit too well. So if that sounds like the sort of thing you want to check out, go to Stitch Fix fix.co.uk slash cycling that's stitch fix s-t-i-t-c-h-f-i-x dot co dot uk forward slash cycling well Lionel uh, last week Daniel and I took ourselves off to meet with Graham Bartlett the chief executive at Velon Velon is the organisation that's it doesn't represent the teams it's owned by 11 of the world tour teams can you name them all (laughs) <laughs> While you're thinking about that, spot. I know um, De Koenig, Quick Step, Ineos, Jumbo, Visma, Bora Hansgrohe, uh, plus another seven. EF Sunweb. Education First, Sunweb, Sunweb yeah. Mitrotten Scott, EF Education First, Lotto Sudal, uh, Trek Segafredo, UAE Team Emirates, and CCC. Well done, Lionel. Um, well that's Lionel. excellent. Um, well, we, we th- they were in the news uh, a few days after the World Championships finished. We learned that they had filed an antitrust complaint with the European Commission about the UCI. And it really centers on two things. The UCI are trying to prevent them using the, the, the word series in there to describe their hammer series. Um, they don't like the idea. Well, while the UCI are, have got their own reforms, and they want to introduce new series themselves. They don't want uh, companies like Velon to run competitions that form part of an overall series. Uh, one-off races appear to be fine. So that's one area of dispute. Another area of dispute is about data and in-race data and who owns the data, whether it's the organisers and by implication the UCI or Velon. Um, and Velon have previously um, argued and, and won the case that, that they and the teams and the riders own that data and can use it and monetize it as they see fit. So these are the two uh, areas of, of dispute really with the UCI. Um, curiously, I mean, the, the complaint was filed actually some time ago. The UCI claim not to have been informed about this complaint yet, officially. Both parties complain that the other side hasn't been speaking to them. So there's a breakdown in communication here and um, it's uh, it could be quite messy. It could also be quite long because um, it could be years before this is resolved. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I think Velon have been around for five years now. Graham Bartlett's been the chief executive throughout. They've they've definitely made some progress in terms of they've, they've organised the Hammer Series that's been running for a few years now. Um, they have been using data in races. They've been pioneering that, really. Um, they, they own some, some rights to races, to broadcast races. They, they even sort of organize races, other races as well. So they're a growing organization. I think some people are probably still confused about what they do and what their, what their mission is. And these are, these are some of the, the questions we asked Graham. And, Rich, we should also point out that um, their, so Velon's complaint or the, the case that they filed with the European Commission um, has been sort of augmented or followed by um, another complaint against the UCI to the European Commission um, today we understand the Lega Pro um, so the Italian League of, or the Italian Cycling League has also made a complaint um, about the UCI um, suggesting that the UCI is not acting um, in the role of, of a regula- regulator and it's pursuing kind of entrepreneurial mm. um, interests. Um, and the main, the kernel of this complaint seems to be this prospect of um, there, there only being, we think, one World Tour, um, sorry, one wildcard team um, at some of the World Tour races next year and particularly the major tours. Um, and this, of course, would, well, it could mean that at the Giro d'Italia next year there's only one Italian team. Yeah, I'm interested to hear what Graham Bartlett has to say. But just before we do, I mean, the, 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 my main observation is that the Hammer Series came along in 2017. The first one was in Limburg in the Netherlands. And it was it was really interesting to watch. I remember being kind of confused by the concept, but then got my head around it as the race went on. Clearly an innovative idea, very 
um, a very telegenic type of spectacle and they've branched out from uh, Limburg and they've held events in Stavanger in Norway and, and Limburg each year since and then they added Hong Kong this year's Hong Kong event was due to be held this weekend but as I said earlier um, that's not going to take place um, the problem that the the Hammer Series races have is they're trying to um, you know, trying to make some headway, trying to grab attention in a cl- crowded, confused, muddled calendar, um, particularly holding a Hammer Series event while the Giro is going on, has been the case for the last couple of years. It, not really giving the, the Hammer Series much of a chance to, um, to get any kind of coverage recognition um, and I think that you know this this dispute between Velon which is effectively um, just over half of the World Tour teams and the UCI in a way is a kind of con- continuation of uh, a, a sort of decade or so long dispute between the major stakeholders that's just been rumbling away the teams versus the UCI the UCI versus ASO the, yeah, the, the teams diff- versus ASO in a sort of an uneasy triangle and this is just the latest flare up it seems yeah, to me and, and the difference this time being that the suspicion is that ASO and the UCI are in league uh, via the relationship between the UCI president, David Lapartion, who of course is French, and, and ASO, which is um, in contrast to the situation where the, the war that went on for a, a few years um, in the mid noughties where it was ASO very much versus the, uh, the UCI. Well, Graham, the news came out this week that Velon has reported the UCI to the European Commission. Um, can you tell us what the nature of of, of the complaint first of all it's nice to be back on podcast it's been a while <laughs> good to see you both um, yeah we filed a, an antitrust complaint to the European Commission against the UCI and um, we did that with the unanimous support of all of our shareholder teams I think it's important to stress that this is not an action that Velon takes on lightly and it's done by all the people who own us which are our teams um, the reason for the complaint is the UCI's use of its regulatory powers to the detriment of the team's business and to favour the UCI's and others' business interests. That's the essence of it. In the past year, we feel that the UCI has tried to stop what Velen and the teams have pioneered in the sport. We pioneered a, a new format of racing, as you know, the Hammer Series, pioneered a lot of new technology. And previously with the UCI, they'd supported these initiatives, but in the last 12 months, we found that they've used their regulatory power and their political leverage to try and frustrate these business activities of Velon and the teams in what we believe is a, is an incorrect and unlawful manner. So that's the reason for the filing of the complaint. And to get to this point, you, you said you know it's our it's last resort, I suppose. Um, dialogue must have been attempted and, and, and broken down, presumably. Yes, I mean, our whole business operation within Velon is based around collaboration. You know, we, we collaborate with teams that are not shareholders, we collaborate with races, we work in partnership with lots of different companies. And that's the essence of our business because we believe that the way the sport will move forward is by more of the stakeholders working more closely together. But with the UCI, um, we found, despite repeated attempts to, one, remind them that certain things do exist within the company we do have an exclusive license from our shareholding teams to to pioneer the data technology in the race that's not you know something we made up it's a fact we've traded that to lots of people um we have created a new race series the uci are well aware of that because they helped us to work on it originally um so these are things that they're very well aware of. But when we've tried to talk to them in the last 12 months about our concerns, about some of the things that they were doing, um, we've been effectively told that, you know, this is, we're not a stakeholder, we don't have any standing, and um, the UCI is not interested in, in discussing the, the issues and the problems we've, we've highlighted. So this, that's caused a great deal of frustration. And in the end, uh, the team felt, look, we just don't have any choice here. Um, we, we can't be in a situation where the UCI believes it can be the regulator of the sport, but also take new business away from the teams and the riders and, and use its regulatory powers for its own commercial benefit and to take those rights from the teams and riders without consultation or permission. Um, so we didn't take the, the matter lightly, but yeah, it's it's been a frustration for quite a long time. 
uh, Graham, they take they seem to have taken particular issue with um, well the Hammer series and you calling it a series. Um, you obviously want to expand that series. There were plans for well, unfortunately, you've had to cancel the race in Hong Kong. But um, what, what's their what is their issue? Do you think with um, the notion of of a rival body setting up a, a series of races? I don't know because <laughs> they haven't told us, Daniel. Unfortunately, um, we pioneered this series as a series I mean we all know and everybody sees the reports that come out whether it's the Rafa roadmap or indeed the UCI's own survey of the fans it would be great if the sport had more narrative story to its season and that's the very essence of what we try to do with Hammer um, and we know that there's a UCI regulation which says that the UCI can bestow that moniker upon um, a race series but there are lots of other race series there's several in Europe and in France there's one there's one in Italy as well there's a pan-European one so it's good for the sport let's build narrative we all agree with that um, so they told us back in February um, that uh, the races hammer races may not be referred to as a series under UCR regulations but no explanation has ever been given uh, and Velon and the teams competing in the hammer events continued to race for the series because it's one of the key features of the new races despite the fact that the UCI said that they may refuse to register hammer races in the future if we do that but no explanation has ever been given as to why the ser- the races shouldn't be a series I mean a lot of people have sort of interpreted it as a, an argument over the use of a, a word but clearly it's a lot more than that and the, the implication is that it looks you know like uh, the UCI are, are, are trying to stop Velon from promoting these events is that also your understanding and why would they be wanting to stop them so it is definitely our understanding because they've written to us and told us that it should not be referred to as a series and is a particular word important well the word in itself isn't but the actual concept is if we all believe there's a strength in a narrative and a season long story then of course you want to tell that story. And the way you do it is by saying this is a series. Hammer Stavanger, um, you know, points at Hammer Limburg, points at Hammer Hong Kong, and the finale is in Hammer Hong Kong. So that's different from saying there's a race in Norway, there's a race in the Netherlands, and there's a race in Hong Kong. It's a totally different thing. You completely change the nature of what you're doing if it's a series or if it's not. You so call it the Hammer League. <laughs> um... I don't know whether the objection is for the particular word, but yeah, it's an interesting idea that, Richard. Maybe we'll just swap words. But we, we've carried on calling it a series because that is what it is and we haven't heard any justification for it not to be. Uh, and because it's the very nature of what it is and what makes it appealing, who's going to win in Hong Kong? Who's, gonna, who's winning after Stavanger? Who's winning after Limburg? And who's winning going to win in Hong Kong? That's, that is your story. So if you take that away, you're just left with another bunch of what I would argue is very exciting races but it doesn't have the special flavour of it being a series which is what everybody in the sport is saying we should do and we've done it and now a governing body is saying you can't so without telling us why uh, Graham I suppose I mean I think it's five years now since uh, Velon launched and I guess the perception of the fan is that there's this organisation which um, intended to change the sport fundamentally the, the way the way the fans consume it, and um, you know in various different ways with data and um, you know more unity for the teams. Um, but people probably think that the big changes are still a way downstream. That they think that there's this organisation that's, that's plotting something and it's going to be important, but it's not necessarily achieved that position yet. Um, but it might. Do you think the UCI is more worried about where you want to get to than what you're doing as an organisation now and the way you're trying to influence and improve the sport as it is now? Um, I think, I don't know what the UCI is worried about um, because they haven't told us. There's, so I can't speak to that. I do know that what we're doing, when they did their last fan survey, it came back that people were in favour of more exciting racing more narrative in the season and more ways of showing the race in cool, new, interesting ways. All of those things are at the heart of what we're trying to achieve. So it would seem the UCI's own survey says that we're doing the right thing. Um, How much have we achieved in in five years? We would like to have done a lot more. 
Of course we would. I mean, you always want to move faster. But I think if I look at our Palmeiras, it's it's pretty good. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously going to say that because I'm I'm, I'm res- you know partly responsible for the work that's done. But we created a new style of racing. The sport hadn't seen a new format of racing in its recent modern history. We brought a whole different set of technology to racing that that doesn't actually exist in any other sport. Never mind mind cycling. You can't get the biometric performance live out of the event in the NFL or the ATP or the Premier League. You can if you've got the technology that Velon uses at your race, like they do in London, like we do in the UAE Tour, like we do in the Giro d'Italia. So I think we've achieved quite a lot against our objectives to entertain the fans and bring more of the excitement of the race to the fans. Um, Our big goal is to change the economic model. Have we achieved that? No. We've seen it shift because shifting an economic model that's been there for pretty much 100 years is not an easy thing to do. But we've definitely seen movement in this because race organisers, whether it's the Tour of Guangxi, whether it's Ride London, whether it's the UAE Tour, whether it's Flanders Classics, have looked at what we're doing and say, hang on a minute, we should collaborate better and more strongly with this because we've both got a common interest that we should make the product, the sport, because it is a product. I mean, people shouldn't be ashamed of talking about this in commercial terms. It's a professional business and it needs to be treated that way. And we make no shame of being a commercial organisation because we're, we're proud of that. You're working in a professional sport. You should be professional and commercial. So those organisers and other partners have come to us and said, look, we agree with the way this should work to make the sport more appealing. We need to grow the fan base. We need a younger fan base. Because if you're going to be professional and if you're going to generate revenue and income, you need to expand that fan base. There needs to be more people excited and attracted to watching and consuming your sport. It's what drives everything. So have we moved the economic model? Yes. Have we got it to where we want it to be? No, because the stability for the stakeholders within the sport remains incredibly fragile. And that applies to teams and a lot of races as well. And we've been adamant since the very beginning that the way to change that is to come together and produce a better race that the fans can look at and see more of and and enjoy and be excited, inspired by in a much more impactful way. That's why we set up Hammer, because we think that's a really appealing, different type of racing that can be grabbed by people. Of course, you're going to have the monuments and the Grand Tours. Absolutely. Where would you ever be without without those guys? They're great, great races. But for a younger demographic and a different fan base, let's have another colour in the palette here rather than another stage race or another one-day race. So we brought that for exactly the same reasons bring more of the excitement of racing to the fans in a way that they can look at impact racing two hours a day over a weekend in one location so you can all come together and really see the sport and then with the existing races we've we've pioneered not just data technology but video technology we worked with aso put cameras on bikes then we worked with rcs to do the data that we've done in the giro so let's pull more of the excitement out from there we're now um, distributing broadcast rights. Velon is now a, a media distributor for certain races for their broadcast rights. So only yesterday we did the Munsterland and we did um, over 140,000 views on a streaming feed for them, which is internationally, that's very impressive. Munsterland doesn't get that kind of audience internationally normally because there can be a demand there. And working with Velon to distribute that, of course, the teams who are in the race help to push the feed, which is great for the race. So we've, we've gone into lots of different areas around the around what we can do with existing races to make it more exciting and impactful for the fans. And we've yeah, set up a new one. punch up after the race always. <laughs> I don't know if that really... Two, two well on teams. Two well on teams. Yeah, we, 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 we arranged that, yeah. So guys, what we need for a new audience is you to have a fight after the race. <laughs> No, there was. Uh, I don't even know if we featured it in the stream. I hope we didn't, because then we can we can say it was nothing to do with us, because it cl- clearly wasn't. Um, but yeah, that's a, a lot of races don't have international coverage, and we're sitting there with the teams saying, "Look, you can help them. You can help them get international coverage, because you can promote 
the fact that you're there to your fans and you can promote to those fans where to see that race. You know, we all know that the revolution in, in sport is coming through, you know, streaming and OTT and, and being able to consume it on, on, on different media and being able to see this wherever you want, anywhere in the world, on any device. And cycling is a sport that really should embrace that because if you want to reach a new audience, you've got to go where they are. You, you can't say, oh, no, 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 you have to go to me. It doesn't work that way anymore. So for all of the races that we're talking to, we'd love to do more distribution with you. We'd love to promote your international coverage and help you distribute that. And Munsterland has, 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 hopefully, I think, I haven't spoken to the race, but I'm, I'm hoping they're very happy with what, what we've done there because 140,000 international views is, is probably a lot more than some sporting events get that they people think are a lot bigger. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much to Science and Sport for their support of the Cycling Podcast. And you can get 25% off all your Science and Sport products with the code SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. That's SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. Uh, we're going to look ahead to Il Lombardia, which I was very tickled earlier to hear Daniel calling the Tour of Lombardy. Because yeah, well, they, they rebranded it, didn't well, it, they? Well, it's funny. We were talking about the series and the UCI's issue with the word series. Well, I know that we've probably mentioned this before, but um, RCS rebranded a few of its races a few years ago um, to to get rid of the, any reference to the word Giro, apart from in the Giro d'Italia, which is why um, it ceased to be the Giro di Lombardia and became Il Lombardia, which I f- find a bit newfangled and naff. So I Quite continue find to call that it new fangled, how well, are going to cope with Well, the next <laughs> item, that, <laughs> that nicely introduces something that you're... I, I must admit, Lionel, um, this, the complexity of this uh, sends my brain into kind of haywire. Well... Do tell... Uh, do, can, the, I want a briefing. Give okay. me a briefing. Dummy's so, guide to what's going on here. So, Richard, I'm sure all of the listeners out there... Let's have, try not to be facetious at any got point me, in this. No, I'm not going to be facetious well, I know at you're all. not. Um, I'm sure the listeners out there have got me pegged as some kind of granddaddish, fuddy-duddy fogey who wouldn't understand indoor cycling on computers. But um, I've used Zwift for a couple of winters now. Um, For those who don't know, you hook up your smart turbo trainer to a computer and Zwift is a virtual world of of courses. Uh, Recently, you could ride the Harrogate World Championship course, for example. Um, Watopia is their virtual world of Zwift and uh, well, it's a it's a really handy training tool. A lot of professional riders use it as well, don't they? Um, and with the world rushing headlong towards the realm of esports, it's uh, no surprise that cycling is uh, well. I think you know, it's to cycling credit, really, that that they're among the vanguard of this movement. I think you say that movement, uh, the world rushing um, to to kind of embrace esports, napalm, but. Um don't want to put you on the spot too much, but what in which sports um, have, or, or kind of which shadow sports have um, esports, the world of esports, ha- has it punched a real hole? I mean, in football, I know there are professional clubs now that have a, a sort of a satellite or shadow esports club and they, they recruit players and they pay money for players, but um, what are the other big ones? I mean, I, I, I <laughs> over to you. I, Buffalo. No, I don't know, but I, but of all of them, I, I do think cycling has the greatest potential in a way because I, I don't know enough about the others, but I see with cycling that it's still the the the, the physical aspect remains, whereas some other esports the, there isn't that physical aspect well i think that's uh, th- there's a lot of these uh, these kind of um, you know f- um, shooting games that, that people play um in organized kind of competitions I and mean, this is this is this is so far out of my uh, mm. uh, my area of interest but you the, can't the, tell. the football <laughs> the football one is interesting an interesting um, comparison because the computer game fifa is obviously licensed by the football's world governing body and so there's already a very strong relationship there and if you have satellite tv you may have seen um, people playing fifa computer game football 
being broadcast on television. Not something that I want to sit and watch, but, you know, it's clearly popular. Um, I think cycling and I think rowing are a little slower to get their act together, but they're the two which which most readily combine the athletic aspect and the kind of the, the, the virtual gaming aspect. Um, anyway, the story that's really rocked the world of e-racing is that at the inaugural British Esports Cycling Championships in March, the winner, Cameron Jeffers, uh, pocketed his £400 prize for the men's event. There was a men's and a women's event. He pocketed his £400 prize, a virtual national championships jersey and a real national championship jersey made out of material that he could actually wear in in real life um so he said not to be facetious i'm trying i'm trying hard here but there is i a haven't seen a picture of this but did it have a does it have any kind of um distinguishing kind of emblem on the front in the same way the time trial one does no no, no it doesn't anyway um like somebody, space invader somebody in, the, in the middle of the rainbow stripes no no no, no. <laughs> no there is a little pac-man logo going no. across the jersey no come on back to the serious subject here now now, if you've not r- ridden on Zwift before, you won't perhaps know that as you sign up, you start on the basic virtual bike with the basic virtual kit. And as you clock hours or kilometers, you unlock um, faster wheels, faster helmets. Uh, you can customize your jerseys and so on. It's really hard not to be facetious. Basically, <laughs> as you as you kind of lurch further and further into your midlife crisis, you've got spending more it's the equivalent of spending more and more money on carbon wheels and you know only only you're spending time aren't you not money yeah yeah, quite and you're progressing through the game and you're earning them and and there's a whole there's a whole network and program of races you can race round the clock if you want um, against other people who are also in their office or garage um, or, or home gym riding on the Zwift so there's a real community aspect to it as well anyway um, the, the, the issue of the controversy was that someone tipped off British Cycling who have um, taken esports under their wing and are uh, have, have kind of uh, made themselves the governing body of the sport um, somebody tipped off British Cycling that Cameron Jeffers the winner had uh, better choose my words slightly carefully here but basically skipped the process to earn the fastest bike on Zwift the um, the Z1 concept bike and basically to get the Z1 concept bike to unlock it you have to complete a really significant athletic challenge basically you have to ride Everest plus about another 15,000 meters of climbing and he uh, hacked into the system I'm trying to keep the language simple here he hacked into the system to set his um, his account to clock up the required meters of climbing um, without him actually having to do the pedaling so he effectively dishonestly acquired the virtual technic- uh, the virtual bike that does give an advantage an athletic advantage in the video game um, now BC contacted him and he denied it initially and then British Cycling and Zwift worked together because they can access the data and it turned out that his account had been logged on in multiple locations including Denmark and Plymouth at the same time so that his account was clocking up the climbing his weight had been uh, reduced down to 45 kilograms and it had been set to ride at 2000 watts for 200 kilometers to unlock the bike so far so straightforward in the end he accepted a specified sanction of six months the 250 pound fine um and was stripped of the title and that title has gone to the runner-up whose name is james phillips um and i gather from british cycling point of view they wanted to establish right at the outset we're really at the very beginning of this this uh this crossover into um you know computer gaming and you know athletic achievement they really wanted to establish that these are proper competitions and that the rules have to be respected there is a bit of debate about um, whether there was a specific rule determining how you acquire the in-game um, upgrades but British Cycling's point of view is that they're right from the very beginning right from December 2018 it was made clear that basically you have to compete honestly uh, the right thing to have done would have been to say look I didn't acquire this bike by pedaling so I won't use it in the competition and so that is where we stand but for me it really opens a very interesting uh, world because there'll be an e-racing world championships next year the UCI and Zwift have have joined forces so that you know there's going to be a a, a legitimate um, you know uh, relationship between the game and the world governing body and insiders reckon that 
esports will be part of the Olympic Games in Los Angeles in 2028. Do we know what WADA's position on it is? Well, funny you say that. The UK anti-doping were at the British Cycling Esports Championships to, to take samples. Um, but presumably, um, you know, WADA have not mandated this. And, um, I mean, does the, the WADA code have any validity when applied to this? I mean, everything that UK anti-doping does should be under the auspices of the WADA code. I think we're in very early stages of all of this being ironed out and, uh, you know, they're, they're, it's going step by step. But in order to be in the Olympics, then the athletes would have to be um, subject to exactly the same uh, anti-doping rules and regulations and testing as riders competing outdoors on the road. I mean, I'm not facetious about this at all, actually. I, I said at the end of the World Championships that we went to the, the Zwift Draft House one night and there, there, was, there were races every night with some of the riders who'd been crowned world champion that day or the day before. And there was a great atmosphere there. And I, so I could see the appeal of, of, of that, of, of, of not replacing road, road racing or time trialing, but uh, as, a, as a sort of extra element. Uh, uh, the, it m- meant the world championships left a sort of bigger footprint in Harrogate and, and gave people things to do and, and things to watch. And gave them a real close-up view of, of world champions. But also the you know the, the the social aspect to it, which sounds kind of paradoxical, contradictory. But that I haven't done that myself. I've I've gone and ridden you know some of these routes, including the, the world world championship course from last year, the Innsbruck one, which I enjoyed. But um, you know, meeting up with people, you've done that, have you not, Lionel? Yeah. Um, well, uh, in terms of making it a spectator sport, I'm not sure I'd want to watch it on television. I I didn't watch it at the time. I must admit, when it was on. No, I'm thinking uh, more live event. Yeah, but as a live event, I could see it being. I'm I'm uh, I'm very interested in the PDC darts, where they have they hire convention centres and lay out all the tables. I mean, without wanting to kind of reduce it to a lowest common denominator, the one thing about the Zwift Draft House in uh, Harrogate was that, you know, people were having a beer. There was a real kind of raucous atmosphere. I think Pete Kenyon was doing the doing the DJing, um, you know. So there was a, there was an atmosphere in there which really worked in a small, mm. confined, hot house type venue. Whether that would then transfer to a, a a big arena, it might well do. People watch the darts. I mean, the dartboard's only a you know a foot and a half across, isn't it? And they watch it from right at the back of the room on big screens. I could possibly see the O2 hosting the, the British Cycling Championships Sawdust in the on future. the floor. I, I think, um, you know, one of the, the the intriguing things and almost unique things about cycling is the, the different elements that, that kind of make up everyone's kind of interest in the sport. If you think of your own sort of personal interest in the sport, it's kind of like a pie chart. And for some people, that the portion um, of their interest that, that comes from the sort of outdoors element to it or the adventure element of it um, is huge and um, for other people you know they're mainly interested in equipment uh, physiology um, the social aspects of it all of you know and those boxes are, are ticked by this but it's not going to be for everyone is it I mean for me um, you know it, it, it overlaps to a certain extent with track racing which has never really particularly cap my captured my um, interest um, so yeah. it's, it's, it's probably less for me than it would be for, for I com- some other people. I completely agree with you I mean it, it, I enjoy riding on Zwift uh, in, during the winter because I think it's a, it's a good way to, to, to get some exercise without going outdoors um, the, the gaming aspect of it is fun you know when you're taking part in it um, I think the in the racing you know there's a there's a few loopholes that that people can uh, exploit just in the kind of the the casual racing just by lowering their weight to, so that their little avatar performs better um which i think you know that sort of detracts a little bit that's why i wouldn't necessarily take the racing side of it seriously notwithstanding the fact that i'm not good enough anyway um but i think just because i'm not interested in it doesn't mean that it couldn't it could go on to be an absolute phenomenon i mean cameron jeffers he issued an explanation for his uh well cheating let's yeah i mean we have to say i guess um on his youtube channel and he's got fifty thousand subscribers now just because that's not the world that I'm interested in doesn't mean it's not going to be a world that particularly not going to be a world that could be monetized quite significantly because I think there's a lot of commercial interest in this kind of world just very lastly but I mean we're going to look at the 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 e-racing phenomenon I think perhaps in in the regular podcast but also in service course as uh, our series uh, continues and develops but my last point about this for now would be that the, the, the really important thing to establish 
in terms of championship racing right now is is this an athletic endeavor or is it a game if it's an athletic endeavor there doesn't seem to be any justification for having people on different types of virtual equipment and that might sound a little bit odd because obviously in physical racing the equipment is actually quite important and everyone isn't all on a standard bike but i just i'm just not sure that for me in terms of sort of the watching it or the the kind of the the storytelling aspect of it i'm just not sure there's really a justification for saying well that person's on slightly quicker pixels than that person that doesn't work for me good point um lionel you mentioned service course and episode three of that will come out <laughs> next week and um, we've got a new presenter lizzie banks the bigla rider who kept an excellent audio diary for us at the Giro Rosa uh, with Tom Wally. That's coming out next week. I've had a listen to the episode. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, it's a really, really interesting subject. It's all about how the world has been designed for and by men and how that affects uh, cycling, bikes, uh, clothing. Um, really, really interesting. Not something I'd thought about um, before, um, about data bias and all that. And uh, really really interesting highly recommend that comes out next week and if if indoor entertainment is your thing uh, don't forget our November tour is coming up um, in uh, well 11th of November we kick off in Bristol at St George's Hall uh, 12th of November in Cardiff 13th of November at Worcester uh, 14th of November Dublin 15th Belfast then the 18th London the Arts Theatre in London and also the 25th at the Arts Theatre in London and then Cambridge on the 26th, uh, Edinburgh on the 27th, Leicester on the 28th, and Manchester on the 30th. Go to thecyclingpodcast.com and live events. So you cl- click on the live events tab there, and that'll take you to the page uh, from which you can buy tickets. Now, this weekend, uh, Il Lombardia on Saturday. I'm going to be there, actually. I'm going out there on a secret mission, um, but that will be for our friends special coming up. Uh, later on um, what do we last year's winner Thibaut Pino missing obviously he's cut the season short so has Julian Alaphilippe uh, who obviously hasn't quite been himself maybe since the Tour de France um, and his exploits there he's he's not riding um, Philippe Gilbert is Vincenzo Nibali Adam Yates you mentioned Lionel what, what are you thinking Daniel starts in Bergamo this year finishes in Como well I think the big form rider is uh Primoz Roglic, Rog, isn't it? The winner of the Giro de Emilia, um, ticks all the boxes, is, you know, has a, a team that is very strong on the climbs. Um, they've managed to sort of, well, tease out the last droplets of energy of a, a few of their riders. A lot of, um, a lot of that team finished the Vuelta very tired, but they've, they've managed to kind of go again for these last um, end of season races. And, and I think they'll be pretty hard to beat. But I also think Adam Yates will be probably quite hard to beat and um, Nibali as well I, th- I think Nibali um, when he finished the Tour de France there was there were question marks about whether he would race again at all um, this year I remember Chiro saying that um, he wanted to finish the, the Tour de France or Chiro suspected he wanted to finish the Tour de France um, mainly so that he could sort of call it a day for the year but that hasn't happened has it um, so I think he'll be strong as well um, one of the sort of traditional decisive climbs that's gone in and out of the route over the last 15 or 20 years the San Fermo de la Batalla climb is back in the route and um, so it should be even more selective this year and you would think that that would favour um, a rider like Roglic but also those other two that we mentioned Yates and Nibali yeah a few other names to conjure with um Fausto Masnada, our old friend from the Giro. Jakob Fulsang, Egan Bernal. Um, there was another name as well that caught my eye as I scrolled through the, the sheet. Mike Woods um, and David Godou was another one, a teammate of Thibaut Pino. Haven't seen a lot of him since the since the Tour de France, but he was very impressive there. And who knows? I mean, he'll probably be the, the team leader for Groupama FTJ. Well, we're, we're recording today, aren't we, Rich, before the uh, Trevalli Varesine, and that in the last few years has been a very a good gauge of, of who's still fresh enough to, to contend uh, at Lombardy. So we'll be watching that with interest today. And Godou was, uh, was fourth, actually, at Bruno Bagelli um, a few days ago in a, in a very, very strong uh, field. So he might be, going, might be a, a decent shout. What, what, who's your tip line? I know you like to speculate. Well, yes, yeah, my strong suit, isn't it? Speculation. Um, I thought the the 
Um, Woods and Sergio Aguita finishing second and third at the Giro della Emilia was interesting and uh, well yeah that's quite quite a sort of uh, quite a tandem those two they're not going to be riding a tandem obviously but quite a duo um, not, so not well we'll see it's, uh, it's a it's a beautiful race to watch though that's lovely. the main thing lovely um, looking forward to it is this the first year that the Tour of Lombardy Il Lombardia sorry and Paris Tour have been on the same weekend I think it I think may it will be. be. It's very discombobulating. I wonder that. if anyone will ride both. Well, we'll see. Killian Kelly will tell us on Sunday evening, if not before, I, th- I would imagine. Um, Killian, if you're listening, do tell us. That. Outsider, Rich, uh, Giulio Ciccone. There we go. Oh, well, on that note, shall we wrap things up? Daniel, bon voyage. Thank you. Good luck in Berlin. Um, and Lionel, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. You have been listening to The Cycling Podcast. Subscribe to our newsletter at thecyclingpodcast.com to get all the latest news and special offers delivered straight to your inbox. This episode was edited and produced by Tom Wally. Listener.